Okay, now that the recording has started, we can start the session. So as I was saying, I'm opening up the floor for discussion just until maybe for 10. And uh, we'll be looking into modeling and I'd like just to know, do we understand why we need modeling, especially for this week's challenge? Can someone just tell me why we need to maybe discuss modeling and uh, where it will be applicable in our challenge this week? So volunteers. Have we all gone through the challenge documents all the way to the end? Have we noticed that we'll be doing some modeling for this challenge, machine learning to be specific when I when I mention modeling? Okay, so you guys are not responding. Let me just mention, so Wango is saying yes. Wango, maybe if you'd speak up and maybe answer that question now that you responded, sorry. Sorry for using you, but, um... oh, okay. So even Margaret has given us the answer. It would be really nice if you guys could actually speak up and practice that professional speaking in maybe in these meetings. So yeah, it is true. When you go through the document uh, on task, I think it's task four. We have task 4.3, which says build a regression model of your choice to predict the satisfaction score of a customer. Yeah, exactly, Birhanu, as Birhanu is saying. So I don't know if we've all been able to just see this line. It's just one line, but it will form a big, I, a considerable part of your work this week and when we talk about modeling regression models do we understand what modeling is i did introduce modeling back in week zero and uh so maybe just volunteers why modeling machine learning to be specific and um yeah maybe we're a regression model i think i did mention that in week zero as well again volunteers if you could speak up it's better on the chat, but chat is also acceptable. Oh, wow, you guys are so quiet today. I think maybe I'll just go straight to the tutorial then and hope that questions will... Yes, Henok. Yes, Henok. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, modeling the means like <clears throat> uh, uh, like modeling or prototyping the real world uh, scenario of the data uh, using machine learning. No, like uh, statistics or uh, uh, this uh, mathematics. So, for example, you know, when we talk about linear regression. Uh, we model uh, decision boundary using uh, y equals to mx plus b, right? So mm, fitting uh, a linear model uh, to separate or uh, to get a decision boundary between uh, two data points or two set of like, yeah, so, so, so on and so forth. Like uh, models uh, can be classified as a classification regression. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you, Henok, for that. Maybe just just to engage you. So for this week, we are doing some telecommun. We, we are dealing with our telecommunication kind of data, and uh, for most of the tasks, we've been asked to do maybe a user overview analysis, an engagement analysis, maybe an experience analysis, and finally, we have that satisfaction analysis that we'll be working on on modeling. So why do you think we need to actually use machine learning for this kind of of a challenge? What is our objective when we use machine learning? Why are we using machine learning for this project? So Henok, just to engage you, because I think the others will also learn when we as I engage you. Henok? Yeah, hello. Yeah, guy. <clears throat> In order to like, uh, you, you've got uh, a past 
like you know, these data are like historical data, data set, right? You have the data, uh, you don't know what the data tells. So you need to uh, draw an insight from the data that you have collected over time. So that, that would help you for uh, decision making or uh, to uh, like uh, it would be it would help uh, so much on decision making and all. So uh, predictive uh, analysis or descriptive analysis, uh, they are part of analysis to make uh, like uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you for that. But let me just uh, go through the hands uh, for anything you have heard. So Mohammed, Mohammed is um Aldin. I think that uh, we should do a revision um, to predict uh, how the customers in the future will be satisfied or uh, this telecom company will make a profit um, in the upcoming years so that the investor uh, could invest his money in uh, a pro profitable company that uh, could generate profit in the future. Thank you, Mohammed, for that and for making it more specific into the challenge that you have today. So, Birhanu, you have something else to add? Birhanu? Yes, uh, to add something on the Enoxate. Uh, modeling mostly important. Uh, before a machine learning come or modeling come, uh, most of the problem is solved within the static. That means, the, uh, for example, when to add something two numbers, you use A plus uh, B. Uh, it's solved by that method. But when come to now, the problem is changed dynamically. So to solve that problem, it, it must, uh, machine it must learn that problem within previous data or, or from the old data. So the modeling is important. In our case, I think a regression uh, model using machine learning or deep, uh, using machine learning, we will do that. Uh, regression is it's, uh, supervised uh, learning, uh, machine learning. And so un unsupervised, uh, that means there is no uh, target, target or labeled data, a uh, labeled class. So uh, depend on the uh, previous user, uh, previous customer uh, user of the telecom, we, we classify the customer is satisfied or not satisfied. I think that. Okay, thank you for that, Hano. So I did you have something else to add on. Uh, actually, I have nothing much. Is uh, based on your question, you are saying why we need machine machine learning for the project. But because we already that will be because we already have a uh, already have an aim, a way to measure a way we measure customer loyalty, which is the engagement, and we want to know what drives that engagement, so that we can we can double down on it and have more customers. That's what we want to predict. Okay, so maybe just to sum up everything and maybe just summary. So Adiju is saying we are trying to predict the engagement. Um, maybe just a correction. I think mostly what you're trying to do is to predict the satisfaction. But yeah, the satisfaction is definitely dependent on the engagement and maybe just how the users are using this data so i did to correct you it's mainly on the yeah. satisfaction not yeah okay so just going straight okay. Yeah. into okay so going straight into modeling i'll do a little bit i haven't prepared uh a presentation but i'll just do a small introduction what machine learning tries to solve or model when you say modeling or what machine learning basically wants to do is to have some kind of prediction on the future on what is going to happen in the future anytime machine learning comes into any any business issue you have this time we have a telecommunication kind of data but anytime you're in a company and you have to do some form of machine learning, it's because we want you to do some form of predicting the future or just understanding the future, what is going to happen in the future. And when we understand the future, it actually um, contributes to the, the decisions we make today. So when you work in um, 
in an organization you'll have maybe the business people looking for an opinion from you what does the data of the what does the historic data tell us so that when we plan for the future what kind of decisions can we make so that's where machine learning comes in specifically so when you have this kind of issue like we have our challenge this week as the technical person now so you go down into modeling and when you do modeling uh, it's Birhano who was mentioning you have to understand the kind of data you have so that you know the kind of model you are coming up with so the kind of model that you, you have come up with at the end is highly no it is majorly dependent on the type of data that you put in into that model and that's where Birhano was saying something uh, the difference between two types of of machine learning we have so this is um, we have supervised sorry sorry for that we have the supervised kind of learning and uh you know is it let me just um Birhano mentioned something um, yeah, that should be supervised versus and supervised. I think I'm saying that right here exactly. So that is supervised and and supervised kind of data. Where supervised is mainly on labeled data and unsupervised is just on unlabeled data. What we mean by a labeled data, if you find yourself asking, is the kind of data that you have already has the output you expect. So for example, if you're trying to predict if customers will come to your shop or not based on a certain number of uh, inputs so your data will have all the inputs maybe the time you open the shop the season or whatever and then the output is yeah maybe to just one or zero one to indicate yes maybe zero to indicate no the same thing like um maybe the satisfaction score you'll have your data and maybe you have uh, derived satisfaction scores for everyone so when you have a single data this person with this input this engagement score this whatever score then you have a specific satisfaction score that satisfaction score will be taken as a label for your data that's what we call the labeled data and then unlabeled data which is mainly used for unsupervised learning is um when you don't have that label in your data any column could function as a label or not or maybe just anything additional and in unsupervised learning we won't look deeper into that today in unsupervised learning the model that you'll be creating will will be trying to just look at your data in general and try to come up to understand if there is a pattern in your data and like when you are doing supervised learning with label data, everything is geared towards that label, which we are trying to do some form of uh, prediction. Okay, so now narrowing down to the supervised learning, again, you'll notice, again, I'm going back to what Birhano and Henok said, depending on the data you have, it will inform the kind of model that you want to predict. And that's where we have uh, mainly problems. You've had like regression, classification and um, in many others I don't think I have everything at mind and you'll find that in classification problems maybe your labeled data has a specific output so it's either one or zero or a yes or no it could actually be a multiple maybe you could have five outputs you could have maybe just one to five and you know these are the only outputs that you can get so this is when you have such kind of a labeled data that is a classification problem because you want to classify a question into these specific groups so it doesn't have to be two most of the time it's two but you could find in some cases maybe it's uh, three or more as long as it's specified number of outputs then your problem is a classification problem and then regression model on the other hand is when your output is um continuous we call it continuous because for example if it's your output is numbers you could find maybe the output expecting ranges from 0, 0.0 to a thousand so that is a lot of numbers in there we don't know where your values will fall and when you're uncertain of where your values that you're predicting will fall but you know that it's yeah we do know that it's a number but it's a, especially maybe if you're doing like we are doing a satisfaction score this time 
yes we don't know what satisfaction score is there but it could be anything so that's why we are doing a regression problem a regression model the same thing maybe if you are with a company and you're trying to predict maybe how the prices will change or maybe yeah let me just focus on the prices then that is also another regression problem because the prices even if they start maybe at 200 dollars they could go anything from 200 maybe to a million dollars so when your label is uh continuous that's when we consider our problem a regression problem and that's where we, we use regression models when your output your labeled data is discrete just a few outputs that's when we consider our problem classification and uh, you will use a classification model so straight into how to do modeling i'll just share my screen and when we do modeling as i had shared i think in week zero we do have very specific steps anytime we are doing modeling it's very very specific steps and the first step you'll always find is just understanding the kind of data that you are using because data will inform your model so if you do put in just garbage you'll have your model just producing garbage or through giggle that is garbage in garbage out that's why we really focus on the data you're putting into your into training your model so that you can start some form of prediction later and uh, with that said let me just share my screen i don't know if okay cool. And with that said, you'll always find that the first step in modeling is the data understanding. So for this week, most of you have already started this part. The last two tutorials were also mainly focused on this part. So I won't dwell a lot into data understanding, just to mention its importance in modeling. And you really have to understand the kind of data that you're using. This way we have exploratory data analysis before you go straight into modeling. Actually. For most of you, at some point, you will be shifting into data engineering. And uh, when you look into the machine learning and data science world, you'll find that most people tend to spend their time in data, just understanding the data. And that's how actually data engineering came up as a career. And right now, a machine learning engineer mainly won't have to do the data understanding part, but the data engineer does. OK, so now I assume we all know what exploratory data analysis is. And for this specific problem, I'll be using uh, diabetic data. This data is also in the data folder that uh, is in week, week one. So if you want to follow along with this notebook, this notebook is shared with you. At the same time, the data is um, in a data folder. So I'm running my Google Collab for reasons only known to me. But uh, yeah, so that's why I'm connecting with my drive. This is the first part, nothing major. If you're using locally, you don't need the first part. But data understanding, I, again, this notebook is not on data on EDA, so it's not in depth. Even the visualization is not here as much. But just the few things you're doing in EDA is just reading your data, just looking at uh, how your data looks, just a, a sample of it, which is what we used to head. And I'm also looking at my columns, which columns do I have? You'll notice I have, how many columns do I have here? I don't know, there's so many, 50 columns. Yeah, we do have 50, 50 columns. Okay, so to the next step of modeling, after you've looked at your data and you know, and you know, maybe your data, okay, so I have 50 columns. Okay, maybe I have a million rows. Okay, so I have, so it's a diabetic kind of data. So, uh, okay, let me just relate to what you have. Okay, so the telecommunication kind of data, you have this number of columns, you have this number of rows. Okay, so you've done some visualizations and you've seen, okay, so this column has maybe missing value or all those things you've done, statistics, you've seen how which columns contributes maybe mainly to your data and you've done all the data, everything you've been doing from the beginning. The next big step in data modeling is what we call data pre-processing. And uh, just to show them what data pre-processing means is preparing your data so that it is ready for modeling. Not every kind of data that you have can just be smoothly modeled. You'll find that 
modeling this are just much this are just code programming code and you'll find that maybe they just understand whatever you do not in natural language but just in ones and zeros in some binary binary sheet so when you tell this machine that uh okay so we have this age this is male this is female that is natural language and your machine won't be able to understand so you might find you want to make your data yes you understand this male this is female but your machine your model your programming does not understand what is male what is female and that's why pre-processing comes in okay so in pre-processing if you just have any question you could uh, stop me and uh, we'll be a question and then we continue if you have uh, questions so in data pre-processing there was a question being asked this morning in stand up will you'll have you'll mainly be looking at handling null values because if you're feeding data into your model and it is and there is no data there i don't know how your model will perform it will just not be it will not be good and that's where you'll find in processing one of the main things we do is uh we find a way to deal with these null values something else we'll be looking at especially in this uh, notebook is something we call standardization so these are just the main that i'll be looking into in this tutorial and the ones that will help you with um, the challenge but there are other pre-processing methods that are mainly dealing with handling categorical val variables like the one i was mentioning about male female and just other categorical variables and this other thing we call one hot encoding it's it's a pre-processing method on its own but it's also mainly used to in handling categorical variables so if you want to understand more on these processes and maybe a little just in depth i've also provided a reference on uh, just pre-processing and how you can do this and many others in detail okay so just straight going straight into handling null values i'll mention something little on why no no how we handle null values and how we handle null values is mainly dependent again on the type of data that you have I don't remember who was asking me this morning. They have an issue with handling null values. And uh, when you're handling null values, you could decide to just drop them, especially if you find that maybe it's an entire column with no data. Why keep that column where it's just empty data? You find that most of the time you just drop it. At the same time, you'd find maybe you're looking at the entire data and some rows have more than multiple columns missing again that's another case of why have that data just drop them but then while dropping is a uh, easy first way of handling null values you'll find it's only useful when you have a lot of data if you have 1 million rows of data if you drop 10 or 50 the data is still huge but if you only have around um let me say 200 rows if you decide to drop 50 or will really be affecting your data so in such scenarios you find that maybe dropping is not, it's not an option and that's where other options come in like so where we have you have to fill those null values and so the other question comes okay so how what do i fill these null values with and in programming in machine learning you'll find this word mainly called imputing and when we say imputing it's just mainly filling that null value and um, you could fill with uh, some some statistic word like maybe a mean, a mod, a medium. You could do some form of backward or a forward fill. I'll talk a little bit about this. But all this is just dependent again on your data. There's also another good article I was looking at. I don't know if I have it here, but it was um, saying when your data and maybe your null values are um, somehow important you'll need to fill them in a certain way if there is no meaning in your data there's no sequence then you can just fill them randomly and uh, with whichever method you feel like it's just best so you'll find for example you're using dates your data is dates and dates you can't just say i'm filling dates with the mod or the median maybe i don't know there's some form of sequence going on with your dates and in such cases you might find yourself using either this forward fill or backward fill so to talk a little bit about forward fill and backward fill 
which is what I think I am using in this in this notebook. We have I did do a function here for forward fill and uh, backward fill. So what forward fill means? Let me just look at a data set somewhere up here. Do I have any data set? Okay. So what forward fill means is let's say this value here says six and the next three values are null. When we do a forward fill, it just takes this none value, which is a six, and feeds in six to the rest of the columns until it finds another non value. I hope that makes sense. So if this is six, the three are null, and this is one, it will fill six to all this and until it reaches the one. If there are other null columns after one, then one will be taken as the next forward fill number. It will leave six and go to one. So that's what forward fill means. And backward fill, again, it's just, instead of starting at six, so we're starting maybe like at the bottom of our data. And you'll find in this case now, if we have these three being nulls, a backward fill will take one and do the ones backward until it reaches that six, and then maybe six for the next, maybe three up if they are null, until it finds the next null value and take that and it goes up. So that's what a backward and a forward fill means. So you'd find that this approach maybe is easier if you are filling dates because, um, I don't know, maybe especially if your date is not just continuous, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, that is easy. You could just fill in the date, which one was next, but you find some form of reputation, fifth, 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 sixth, 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 sixth. It should be easier to assume that the missing one could be just somewhere ranging in between there. So you just do either forward or backward fill with a, with a good guess and then look at how it has affected your data. Otherwise, I did say about imputing with mods, this, this notebook is very i'll say very good because i've introduced the forward fill and how we use it because this is given by pandas so how a forward field is used and how a backward field is also used and i've also given down here on how you can input so here it's just using mod the mod of your data frame but you could decide to either use a uh, median or mod median mean or mean Again, when you're doing maybe a mod, a median, or main, this is when your data maybe does not really make sense. Maybe you're looking at the weight, the weight of students, and uh, you find that the weight, the weight of students, maybe you just have random values. They don't really have any meaning in relation to each other. But then there's one that is missing. So to fill this value, just use what, what is recurring the most and just fill it there. What is the mean and just fill it there because it won't affect the mean in the end and such and such so before i continue i see joseph is saying the he did not get forward and backward fill so because i'm talking a lot i don't know if there's anyone who has understood what is forward and backward fill maybe we get another definition from someone else who has understood the difference between forward and backward fill can i get volunteers to explain this to Josias? Or maybe just to talk to you, Josias, if you speak up, what exactly have you not understood or what have you gotten with uh, the forward and backward fail methods given by pandas, Josias? Yeah, I did not get the process how it works. So you didn't get anything, you didn't get anything at all? Uh, um, I will say no because at that time I had no expectations. Oh, okay. All right. that's, that's understandable. Okay, so, since there's no one to assist, let me just go ahead and do it. So, um, let me see if this data has null. Exactly. So, let me see if there's one with a little bit more data. No. Okay, so what I was saying just yes is uh, you could find maybe in your data set, you have a value like, let's use these values here. So you have maybe the first one here is a six, then maybe the next two are null. Maybe here you have a one. I hope you are following through. And then maybe the next one is also null. So what forward fill means is just take a non value and uh, for the next few columns, no, no rows that are null, 
fill those null rows with this value. So if here we have six and the next two are null, it will take six and fill the next two with six. It's a forward fill until maybe it finds the next value is not a null, so it's a number. Okay, so it stops the forward fill there. It goes until it realizes, okay, there's another null value. So what is the the number that was non-null non -null immediately before? So if we again have one here and this is null, it will take that one and do again another forward fill until it reaches another non-null value. Does that make sense, Joseph, for the forward fill? Yes, it makes sense. Okay, then the backward fill is just the opposite. Instead of starting at the top and filling forward, kind of start at the bottom and fill backwards. So you'll find maybe if this is one and we were filling one going forward, it will just take one and fill upwards, so backwards. So that's a backward fill. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay, so I don't know if there are other questions or I can just continue. Okay, so they are just explaining forward and backward fill. Okay, so going on next to um, after dealing with null values, you'll find the other thing I mentioned we'll be looking at is um, standardization. And what standardization means, I think we all understand standardization. We've, we've met this term, I think, even in school. And uh, most of the time you'll find students, there are those students with three, and there are those students with a hundred. And the data is just kind of not making sense because it's too wide. And maybe most of the time they did standardize the marks so that the one with the highest, they lower their points and the one with the, with the lowest, they increase their points until it's somehow with a nice normal standardized range, a normal, this, a normal kind of distribution. So the same way in the machine learning standardization, you'll find that maybe your input values are very wide in range, especially if you're talking of numbers. And example, I'll go back again to price. And your lowest price is maybe at something like $20. And your highest price is something at like, um, yeah, a million dollars. That's a really broad range. And when your, your model is looking at this data, it may tend to favor where the data lies more, like maybe if most things fall under $700, it will tend to favor that data more anytime it gives some form of prediction. So to get rid of this problem, that's where standardization comes in. And standardization just gives it a range of values. And most of the time it's maybe between negative one and one. Everything with it's $20 or a million, they're all standardized back to this specific range in between negative one and one so that your model cannot be biased on a certain specific recurring kind of data. Okay, so with that said, we do have a scalar that gives us this thing we call it standard, standards. Oh, okay, I didn't even, I'm not even doing standard scaling here, I'm doing label encoding. Okay, so we do have standard scalar. I'm so sorry, I, did, I, I thought I was doing, I thought I was doing standardization. So we have the standard scalar given by sklearn.preprocessing as well. So let me just do an import here. I don't know if it will allow. So from sklearn.preprocessing import standard Okay, so what standard scalar does, as I've said, is just all your data into a specific range. And for standard scaling is, I think it's normally between negative one and one or zero and one, everything is put into that range. Another form of pre-processing we could do is, uh, so I, I forgot I was doing this instead of standard scaling. It's what we call label encoder. And this is actually mainly done for categorical variables. And what label encoding is, is for any categorical variables, like if we have maybe gender, and we have male, female, binary, other, this day there are so many genders. So let's say we have five genders, and they have all been represented categorically. That means in natural language. 
so you could decide to assign male to one female to two binary to three maybe whatever other to four so what label encoding does it just gets all the unique values in your column like now maybe the gender and assign just the next number to that to that variable does that make sense i hope that makes sense so if it's in a case where you have like let me say the handsets and you have samsung you have uh, you have uh, you have samsung you have maybe infinix maybe iphone maybe okay and many others techno there are so many they're on different countries i don't know which one you use in your country so if maybe you have different types five types of handsets so what label encoding does it just takes the first one that it will encounter maybe samsung is the first one and it's called samsung one goes next and it finds or oh, iphone okay iphone becomes two goes ahead and finds infinix or whatever and then that becomes three so all the all the values that were in categorical or natural language are now in a number format and you'll notice this kind of data again you might find in a case maybe you have a hundred a hundred different types of categoricals whatever and now that again you have one to a hundred that's again a huge it's too huge if you have one to a hundred or one to a thousand and you'll find in such a case then you do maybe a standard scalar again after that so i don't think i did a standard scaling here so i'm too sorry for that i was just going to introduce you to pre-processing and what some of them that they're here so label encoding you'll notice like for example here we have gender when we had our data before before doing any form of uh, label encoding our gender was mainly just female and male and so it encountered female the first does not mean there is any preference so it encountered female first so female gets the value zero and the next maybe it was male okay so then male gets the next value which was one in our case if we had maybe now binary as the next value that value would be assigned to two so that is just basically label encoding and now you see our data here it's mainly just numbers everything is just numbers and nothing is in the form of of natural language so before i go into modeling just to mention a little bit about pre-processing as i was saying you'll find maybe most of our numbers here are in maybe one one zero seven but you'll find like this range where we have 59 73 maybe these values actually start from zero all the way to 73 and as i was saying if your range is too huge you've just done some label encoding and, your lib and the, uh, the values are, the range is too high. This is where now we do the standard scaling and just say for this specific column, let me values just range between zero and one. The standard scaler will do that for you, depending on the statistics it uses behind it. So now because I'm mentioning uh, this processing method, the other thing you need to know is one hot, one hot encoding, I'd mentioned that before. And it's, it does work like, label encoding in a way because it's mainly used for categorical variables but instead of just assigning the values in a should i say progressive way one two three four continuous it takes every value like for example here we have female and male and makes them into a column so you'll have maybe we have female here and then male so in this column called female everyone who was female originally will get the value one and everyone who was not female gets the value zero. If the other value was male, it's an entire column on its own. And it's an entire column. If you're originally male, the value becomes one. And if you are not male, the value becomes zero. So it does that for every single every single unique unique feature you have in your column. And this is not a good approach, especially if you have a huge data. You really notice we have two columns. If you decide to go ahead and increase the number of columns you'll have huge data and that's why unless your data is too small one hot one hot encoding is mainly not advised okay now we have our data it has no null values and it is in a way that our machine can understand then we go into modeling so for our case i will look specifically into a labels kind of data which is what we will be using and um, a regression you know here i'm using a classification but we'll also just look at what a regression kind of problem 
looks like. So when we are doing modeling, especially in a labeled kind of data, we have these two main important things. We have the features and we have the label. So the features is everything that contributes to this label. Like for example, if you are looking at yeah, the satisfaction score, and the satisfaction score is uh, dependent on the engagement score. Maybe it is dependent on the number, the session duration. The bit is dependent on so many other things. So everything that's that leads to that satisfaction score. Everything that leads to that satisfaction score is what we call our features. And then now this, which is what we are being we're predicting, is what we call our label. So in machine learning, this is um, the two are, are easily defined as X and Y, where X are all the features and Y is this label that we are trying to now predict. So, Mohammed, I see you're mentioning about normalization. I'll circle back to that. Let me just continue with the modeling for flow, but I will get back to normalization at the end. Okay, now that we have our two values, we have our X and our Y. Normally, when we were doing from the beginning, we had all the values in one data frame. So if this is our first step, we need our features aside and we need our label aside. So the first thing we do in modeling is just to separate our data frame into two. We have our Y, which is now our label, and we have our X, which is our features, which just drops the label column and everything else becomes the features X in this case. So the next thing we do is that you'll notice like, for example, here I had 40, 42 columns. And in some cases you'll find that not every column actually contributes to your label. Most columns are just, they're not important. Let me just, let me sort of say so, but they're just not important in informing your model, especially when you have a lot of columns. Here we have 42 columns. You might find cases where you have more than 42 columns or uh, less than 42 columns. So if you have a lot of columns, not every column has to be used for training your model. One, it will take a lot of computing time to train your model. And two, it will just misinform your model because they don't really contribute to your label. So the next thing you'll find yourself doing is uh, for these features, now that I've dropped my Y, so I'm assuming I have 41 features, is to find out which features are important. And that's where we have the next thing called um, feature selection or feature importance. Let me, you can either do that, either feature selection, feature importance, feature engineering, so many things, so many terms are used, but they all mean the same thing. We're just looking at the features out of this many that are important. So again, SKLearn gives you a couple of methods you can use to just check the best features calculate a certain score how does that score affect how does that score affect your label and then when you have score for all your features you can now say okay i'll choose these 10 best features because they seem to be contributing to my to my label more okay so with this small code here where we are just using again a method by sklearn we are getting the features and their scores and just printing that out so i do have an entire list here of all the features we did have 42 41 features so this should be around let me just see yeah so 42 feature, 41 features okay yeah, we do have zero so these are 41 features with every feature having its score on how it contributes to our label so you'll notice there are features here that completely have no importance feature 31 and that so they don't contribute to our label at all we have like feature 34 here which has zero sorry we have feature that two here with that t4 here which has uh an importance of 0 0.007 whatever and we have features that have a lot they contribute a lot to our label you see values here with like 4000 they have a score of 4000 a score of 12000 a score of 1000 these are really really important features and when we just do this into a small bar graph a small bar graph you'll notice out of all our 40 features maybe this this feature should be around number 12 is the most important followed by this this and this feature so you'll find that out of 40 columns from just looking at this this bar graph we have around one two three four five six seven eight 
around 13 important features in all the 40, only 13 really contribute to our data. So instead of holding on to all the 41 columns, you could just drop the rest and remain with these very important features that will correctly inform your model. And that's what is happening here next. You'll, you'll notice I'm just selecting a couple of features. The one I noticed that they were important, so just listed out them there. And I have selected features now forming my X, which was my we said we have features and we have our label data. So my selected features have just reduced to all of them into maybe specific just three or 13. Let me see how many I selected. Let me have a shape here. Yeah. Okay, so no shape. This is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Only nine features were selected to contribute to our model that we call feature engineering or feature importance. Okay, so uh, there are no questions on that. So again, I'll just continue. Okay, wait, there's a question. Yes, Mohammed. So uh, I'm asking about uh, when we're selecting uh, the feature before before we, we use the SQL uh, function uh, to point out or to give points for features. Do we... Um, provide the, the function with uh, the features that you want to, to scale or uh, we want to, to calculate its value or its contribution to our label or we just give uh, give it our data set and uh, it, it decide which uh, feature is contributing to our labels. Okay, so when you're doing feature selection, especially with the method that I'm using for this this specific notebook, you have to give it all your features. That is now the X, all the X variables that you have, and your target variable, which is now the label variable. You'll notice, um, let me just go back to that code. Yeah, you'll notice here when I'm using this select K best features, I am, I am giving it my X and my Y, where X is basically just every other column except the target column, which is our Y. So here we have all our features and our target column, and those are the two that I am giving to my selector. Let me call it a selector. I don't think that's the one, but uh, let me call it my selector. So I am giving those two so that it can do its form of fitting and transformation and then give me the score of each feature in relation to my target variable. Does, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And you also notice here that I am using a score function, the G square. So I think there are a couple of a score matrix you could use. Here I'm just using a G square. I don't know. Yeah, I'm using a G square. This is mainly into statistics. <laughs> don't think I can explain that far, but a G square is the score function that I'm using for my features. There are many score metrics you could use, um, provided maybe by here I'm using a select K best. So you could just check select k based which score functions does it offer and uh, same thing if you have another feature selection library you could just check which functions does it offer so here you see you have f creative um okay so it does not list all this all the um, yeah it does it has yeah, you could see here we have an F value being used or either a G-square, again, an F value. Is this percentile? Okay, so each and every every library could have its specific methods, metrics to use to score your functions. Then you can just use the score and select the best features that contribute to your target variable. I hope that's clear. Yes, just as just mentioned, we have our statistician here that it is used to measure independence. So does that mean just as just as maybe just pick up? Uh, I think 
I think that we use it we use it to measure the independence between I think between variables. So how related they are. Yeah, okay, yeah, I get I get that approach, but when we say cheese, when cheese square is used in any in any context, it is always used to measure independence. That's what I think that's what I was I was asking. When whenever cheese square is used, it's always used to measure independence. Joseph? Yes, I think. It's specifically for independence. So in okay. this approach, maybe we would like to choose uh, the features who, uh, 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 which are mostly related to the the target. Something like that, I think. Uh, okay. So Hannes is asking feature selection versus feature extraction. I'd say it's the same, but of course what extraction means is you take specific features. So maybe you've already taken them from, from 42, you have nine. So when you say feature extraction is you're taking them from, like yeah, from 42 to nine, but you know exactly which features you're extracting. But when we say feature selection, we don't know which feature we'll be selecting, but then now a scalar and can tell us select this feature. Then now we will extract those specific features that have the highest score or contribution to our um, to our target variable. Yes, Mohammed, go ahead. Uh, do we need to, to do standardization and normalization before we do uh, exploratory data analysis or BDA? It's not done before. That is just EDA. The moment you start changing values, you've gone into pre-processing and the clearly standardization and normalization, they're both changing our values to something that the model can understand. So yeah, this comes after EDA. Yes, just yes. Yeah, I would like to know if we have to do at the same time standardization and normalization. No, no, not really. I don't think we we don't have to do both of them in a model. It will mainly depend on the kind of data that you have. Again, as I was saying, when you consider standardization or normalization, it depends on how wide or uh, how wide does your data look. Like, if you have all your values in a really nice format, like they don't have that wide range. You'll even find sometimes you don't need to do any form of normalization. Normalization and normalization comes in with the type of data that you have and uh, the changes that you want to make it to that. So you don't have to do these steps. Let me just mention that. But you will use them when you want to make your data, when you want to process your data in a way that the model can understand. So again, you don't have to do both standardization and normalization. I think both of them, they target the same thing just to do that form of standardizing a data or normalizing. It's just, they kind of do the same just in different approaches, both standardization and normalization. Again, also to answer Mohammed, they, I think they do the same, but using different approaches and different libraries. But standardization and normalization should just be exactly the same. Yes, yes, yes. You have something to add? No, it's okay then. It's good for me. Okay, so Mohammed. Okay, Mohammed. Mohammed, go ahead. So uh, I couldn't hear the answer before because uh, my net was cut off. So um, mm -hmm. the first, uh, I and I want to ask more, one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. Could I say that normalization is uh, uh, is done for uh, numbers or float or integer uh, variables, and standardization is for strings and objects? Mm -hmm. 
Um, not, not really. I don't think that is the main difference. Main difference between standardization and scale and uh, normalization because standardization, as I was mentioning before, I actually think your values or whatever the values are trying to standardize already need to be numerical. Already, whether you're doing standardization or normalization. So it's not mainly whether your data is categorical or, or, what's the other one? or numerical. So I see it in academy team. Is that, is that Azaria? Uh, Azaria, is that okay. you? This is, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I just want oh, to add on the, yeah, no problem. Uh, so just want to add on the type of data that Anastasia said. Yes, primarily you'd uh, look on the type of the, the, the data that you have to perform standardization or normalization. And uh, if you need some kind of Gaussian based, or if you are looking for Gaussian based data or uh, N shaped data, you'd go for uh, standardization because standardization would normally take your mean to zero and to the standard deviation to one. But in addition to that, the type of model that you're going to use also matters because if you perform some kind of modeling based on decision tree or uh, yes, mostly decision based models like decision tree, you wouldn't normalize or standardize data because they don't depend on the scale of the data set that they only depend or they are only working on uh, choosing between different types of conditions when you are working on decision based models. So you wouldn't normalize or standardization on when it comes to standardizing or uh, normalizing categorical or numerical variables or data, uh, first of all, what standardization or normalization does is it just scales your data to a specific range. When it comes to normalization and standardization, it will take that uh, the mean to zero. So mostly you'd only use numerical uh, data because you are scaling that up to a specific range. And you wouldn't perform such kind of operations on uh, categorical uh, variables because uh, when you are going to feed your categorical variables to the machine learning model, you'd normally, as Anastasia said earlier, you'd perform the one hot encoding or different types of hot encoding so that it will be converted to uh, numbers like zero and one and one. So once they are encoded to the format that you want them, they are already in a format that you want them to be because they are already still doing their uh, in the encoded format, but you'd standardize or normalize your data when they are in the numerical uh, form. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Mohammed. Yes, thank you. Okay, so maybe to answer, um, I don't know, I think Edidia will provide an answer for Josias. What he meant is that we don't need to do any form of change. So it's not that we need something else. We don't need to do any form of standardizing or normalizing when we use that, those kind of, of models. And to Nat Nile, uh, what if we have too many features to do hot encoding? You cannot feed a categorical data to a model, so you just have to encode it in a way, either using the one hot encoder or maybe the label encoder. You just have, it, it doesn't matter how many features you have, you just have to do it, honestly, because you can't feed a categorical data into your model. Okay, so Johannes, Johannes, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, when we want to maximize the performance of the model, we have to consider uh, like quality of data, algorithms, and uh, a parameter like parameter turning, and also meta uh, algorithms. That means uh, maybe in general uh, machine learning algorithms. But my question is, can we put in order to 
which one is the most needed to maximize the model? Is it quality data or um, uh, the algorithms or meta algorithms uh, or uh, parameter tuning? Okay, thank you for that question. That's a good question. And I've encountered this question before, and I think I'll answer depending on what I have learned uh, so far. And data, data is, according to my opinion, data is the main important. It's the most important when it comes to model training. When you talk about maybe just parameter tuning or the algorithm that you're using, that comes later and it will just improve the performance of your data, like of your model. Like for example, if, um, if your model is performing at 80%, parameter tuning or um, the model you're using could just change it from 80 to 82%. Just a small percentage, but it's something that has been increased. But with data, if your data is really bad, you could have like a performance of 50%. And then you do a lot of pre-processing to your data and you change your data. And that performance could go from as low as 50 to 80. Just you could try with uh, even the diabetic data I've given and don't do any standardization. Do not remove any values and just do your, your model. You'll find that the value is really, 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 sorry, low. But when you just do this processes, data pre-processing, just filling null values, doing some encoding, some standardization, your model performance will improve significantly. As saying, as Henok is saying, data-centric versus model-centric. So yeah, that I, I do believe in data. But again, when you do models, you'll find that you train more than one model. You could decide, okay, I am doing a regression problem, so let me do a linear regression. The basic, let me also do a random forest regressor. Let me also do an XG boost and use different models. Then you find out, okay, so XG boost is, uh, it is performing better, maybe it's tree based or whatever. So you decide, okay, instead of using linear regressor, let me use let me use now the XG boost. Then you go ahead into your XG boost and now you tune the parameters in XG boost to perform even better. So I think that's the best approach to use. Is that clear, Johannes? Thank you. Okay, so for Mohammed, just to answer that, EDA comes before data pre-processing, any form of pre-processing if standardization included so that comes before okay so to go next so we have our features the best features that will contribute to our model we have that and now what remains is training so in training it's not now we go straight to our model and in training we do have the train version and the test version. So what train and test mean is with training data, you will train your model. With test data, you will test your model. Very simple. So training and testing split. So what train tests, as I've said, you know, when you, when you train your model on one data and then test your model on the same data, of course, your model will perform 100% perfectly which in this case will be known as an overfitting because it has already seen this data. That's why we do need to do some form of splitting our trained data and our test data so that it is um, from the pattern it learned from your trained data, it can now try to do some form of prediction with new unseen data. That's why we do some form of splitting. So normally we, we use this trained test split method again by SKLAN. And normally we do an 80-20 kind of split. So here my test size, you know, it is, it is 0 0.2. So that is 20%. Uh, but in some cases you'll find, especially maybe you're doing, you're going to a job interview and they say do a 70-30% split. You shouldn't forget to do such small, small changes. Okay, so there are other forms of splitting. We won't go again deeper in this tutorial. I think we'll cover them as the weeks progress. I had mentioned earlier about validation and cross-fold validation. All those form part of the splitting. 
but we'll look that in detail in other tutorials that come. So when you split when you, sorry, when you split our data into the train and test, then we go directly into okay, into training our model. So again, I've noticed I, I my, my my code is all over. I'm also using another scaling another uh, standardization this is a normalized this is a, actually this is normalization the mean max scalar so we already talked about this again i want to talk about that so i wanted to go straight into into the into the model training so yeah so in this case i am using a random forest classifier we could just again import a random forest regressor and see how this process flows because any model has very specific steps you just take the model you give it your train values so you give it all your x features and all your labeled data so you fit data into your model so it will do its training whatever time it takes and then you do some form of prediction so here would be like r d predict okay so let me let me just i noticed i have not done any form of prediction okay so let me just add some code here and we can follow through so okay so you notice as i've said you just initialize your model we already have the model initialized here it's a random forest classifier and then to your model you fit your train value so that is x train and y train and then when you do your fitting so you've created your model that is R and D, and then you've done some form of fitting with your X data and Y, specifically the train. We just add the word train here so that it's X train. And then after you do your fitting, what you do next is whatever again method you have, R and D dot predict. Predict. And when you're doing prediction, we only give it our test features. Like for example, we have um x test we did in our splitting we did specify x train x test y train y test so x train and x test no x train and y train are used to train your model x test alone is used during prediction and then y test can be used when scoring your model because what what prediction does it just takes your features without the output and tries to predict those outputs. So whatever the outputs you get from your model, you can now compare with your real outputs, which is your whitest, and then score your model. This is what is happening, is happening here. So I haven't done any form of prediction here. This is this is bad. But yeah, again, it's the same thing. You just take your model and do some R and D dot predict and you give it your your test features. Okay, and then finally, as I've said here, you see we are doing a score, we are doing a score and you have to do with your X test and with your Y test. And you can see my, my model score is 52%, very, very, very low. And that's where we go back again, maybe do some pre -pro more pre-processing or again now go into your model and do some parameter tuning if maybe you are targeting a score of 80% or higher. So this score is really, really low. So finally, after doing modeling, what other the other thing we do, which I've already mentioned, is um, gauging the accuracy of your model, and that's where we have these things like the score. Most of our uh, of the models gives us score, but SKLearn as well gives us metrics like uh, that can give us like a classification report that can give us this is a confusion matrix, and uh, the confusion matrix gives you like. Uh, a little bit small values like maybe the precision the precision of your model the recall of your model the f1 score and we also have the accuracy down here it gives you a little bit details on uh, the, how your model did perform then you can now go back and change a few things so with that process say that is the process of modeling so if you go all the way to down and you have your scores and your score is just 0 0.52 which is now 52 percent you could decide oh, okay Maybe let me try and use another model or if you are sure you did your processing really well. So let me just try another model, maybe an XG boost, um, a decision tree. There's so many models. I don't think I can name all of them. Yeah. 
So I don't know if you've understood if there are any questions. Maybe if I can practically. So someone is saying here, even the emulation not affect the pain. So, Johannes, is there a question? Yeah. When you're saying even the normalization don't affect RF, is there a question or a statement? So as you answer that, let me go to the next question. Okay. Gideon, Gideon, go ahead. Okay. Hello, can you Gideon, can ahead. you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I had two questions. Uh, one of my questions is we in both of the tutorials back in week zero in this week's tutorial we used random forest classifier is there any particular reason we're using that specific model could we swap that for a neural network or a logistics regression model and the other question is uh, you used pickle in your code and are you using pickle to save the model Okay, so to answer the first question, the reason why you're using classifieds because, as I had mentioned before, the type of data that you that you have. In my case, I was trying to predict if these diabetic patients can will either be readmitted or not. So you'll notice my output is just two, one or zero readmitted or not. So my problem was a kind of a classification problem, and that's why I'm using a random forest classifier. In a, in your case, you you'll be you'll be predicting the satisfaction score, a very continuous number, and instead of using a random forest classifier, you'll be looking for regression kind of models, and for regression models, you'll find maybe you have random forest regressor, you have the linear rig regression we have that decision tree we also i think it also has a regressor i also think that the xg xg boost is another form of a regressor so you don't have to use random forest classifier this is just being used because of the type of problem we had the classifier part random forest is again you notice now the random forest parts i think random forest is a uh, is it a tree-based kind of model? And tree-based models tend to be preferred instead of like the linear regressor, which is just a linear model, a linear kind of model. You'll find that the tree the tree-based models are mainly they mainly perform better in most cases. And that's why you'll find most people using either the random forest, the decision tree, or the XG boost. They just perform better than the linear models. That's why we use a random forest mainly, but this is just to show. And that's the reason for the classifier. The other question you've asked is uh, yeah, the pickle. I didn't mention that. So I'm sorry for that. I'm using pickle here to save my model so that it can be used maybe in another platform or um, just to save my model. You'd find that maybe for this week, if you're going to do a dashboard, you'd want your client, your employer, to interact with your model without going through this code, everything that you've been doing. So the, the output model that you're satisfied with, maybe with an 80% accuracy, that's model you save. And that's why we're using a uh, pickle, the labeler ray pickle to, to save our model. Then this model, uh, you'll notice it's actually saving. It's I've, I've done some saving. This is just my drive because I'm using Google Collab. And yeah. I have two models saved. We have the scalar.joblib and scalar.pickle. I have saved these two models and these models you can now deploy them maybe to like your dashboard so that's just also interacting with your dashboard they can use this model that's why i'm using pickle that makes it clear yes thank you okay so i don't know if these are questions uh henok dependent um so henok are those questions or just a more information yes yes this notebook is in the shared folder it's called data modeling data modeling dot i p y n b Okay, so here not that is just more information. So 
I don't know if there's any other question we could tackle now before we end the class. We already 19 minutes past. So are there any other questions on modeling? Maybe something you've not understood. Okay. So just a summary. I don't know if we're, um, just a summary of uh, modeling. Data, data is important. The kind of data you feed into your model for training, if you have model algorithm for training, so make sure to do pre-processing. And we have uh, different ways of pre-processing, handling null values, scaling, normalization, and encoding. Then when you go straight to modeling, the process is basically the same. So just split your data, split your data into the train set, the test set, Make sure you have your features aside, you have your um, target variable aside. And then we go next to training direct. You could do this with different models. You don't have to do it with one. So it doesn't have to just be a random. Most of the time we use multiple models. So always start with a linear, a linear, a linear model. So either it's just um I don't know, there is, apart from a linear regression, there's another one that is mainly used for classification problems. I think it's, no, sorry, we have the linear and we have the logistic, sorry. We have the linear model and we have the logistic used for regression. I keep confusing these words. So it's always, it's always advised to start with something basic, a linear model. So either a linear, um, I don't know, why do I keep forgetting? So there's a model, a linear model, or a logistic regression which are a different problem. Then you go to a tree kind of model, so either a decision tree, that random forest, or maybe an XG boost. Then you now compare the functionality of your models and choose your best model. Score. The final part is scoring so that you get the how, how is your model performing. And then depending on how your model performs, you just go back either all the way to data preprocessing if you didn't do it correctly. Or if you are sure you did it correctly, you just go to your model and just do a little bit of other parameter training. I don't think for this week all that will be required. This week is just basic machine learning. So you don't need to go through all that. Yeah, just doing a, coming up with a model that has already been trained and can do some form of prediction. That is always required from this week. Okay, and with that, I think that summarizes the tutorial. I don't know if there are any other questions, but you can end there. Something is saying that there is no training part in the file. No, no, it's there. Training, actually training, training in machine learning actually happens in one line. The line that is doing the training, this is the line that is doing the training. That line alone is doing the model training. So we do have the code for training. It's always just this word, dot fit. And that is enough, that is training. This line is training. I don't know if that's that's clear. Okay. The sub is still here. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure. Training is in the data modeling, data API and B file, and it's just one line. Everything else is just preparation, which is very important. Preparation for that training. It's just one line training. And as I was saying, you could try and just do a training of your data without any changes and see how it performs. So that when you do some form of change, some form of pre-processing, then you see that significant change in your model. You could just do that for for fun. Of course, the one that is original will have a very low score and it will not help a lot. So you could do that just to see the difference because most of everything we are doing up here is just preparing our data for training. Oh, okay. So with that, I don't think there's any other question. We, could, uh, we can end there.
there are any questions so just ask it slack and uh, the community or any